Thank you. Okay, so um, I will post this to my blog. I have to, as you'll see, go back and add photo captions before I do that. Um, and I may have to remove a couple of the photos depending upon permissions, but uh, hopefully most of this will get there. Um, and the blog address is posted here at the bottom. I'll also have it on the last slide. So as we're wrapping up, you can refer to that as well. Um, and uh, post the thank yous here while I talk about a few things at the beginning. Um, at the end, I'll have a, a page of references, but I think the, you know, there, there are a couple things that are really strong. One, the, the PFE book that I think everyone in the hobby has probably heard from uh, has um, is an invaluable resource. It has more information than you, know, you could possibly share in, in a presentation like this. Um, I also want to mention if you're really interested in digging through the subject, the California State Railroad Museum Library has a trove of information, including uh, PFE car cards and what those are. Um, I don't think they have all cars, but they have a huge number. And those car cards um, were documented every significant, uh, you know, maintenance, painting, repairs, rebuildings, everything that happened to every car. So you can track, you know, what types of changes were made to cars, when they got AB brakes, when they were painted, where all those things were done, and the dates they occurred. So they're, they're incredibly valuable. Um, and yeah, I, again, that, that book is, is incredibly valuable as well. Um, mentioning the thank yous here, one in particular I want to mention just because um, for those of you who don't know, Frank Peacock passed away a couple of days ago. And, um, you know, I, I know for me personally, he was a tremendous help with information. Uh, he, you know, spent years crawling under cars, measuring things, drawing in sketchbooks. Uh, if you went to RPMs, you, you probably saw him. Um, and, you know, he, he didn't write a lot or, or post a lot or things like that, but um, a lot of information that he had in his personal collection made its way into books, particularly Railway Prototype Cyclopedia, as well as some things um, I published. And, uh, you know, he definitely one of the, the driving forces in, in prototype modeling. So it's, you know, a huge loss uh, for all of us. Um, and, you know, I'm going to write up a little tribute to him on my blog, but, you know, it's, it's just very sad that um, uh, another kind of one of the deans of, of what we do has, has gone. Um, <clears throat> so to kind of start here, I've, I've put together, um, a, sort of some parameters. Basically, I, I used the uh, equipment register from January 53 to compile this information. Um, and I put every PFE class in here that had at least 100 cars. Um, so, you know, by that criterion, um, the table that I present here makes up 98 plus percent of the PFE fleet which at that time was you know, 38 and a half thousand cars. Um, the two that are highlighted here, the Dash 9 and the, the R40-23, um, I highlighted those because they're actually broken up into two different series. So uh, you have to aggregate them to get the total number. Um, and this particular table lists them from smallest, right, largest to smallest. Um, this next table lists them numerically you know, uh, starting with the, the lowest series and going up to the highest. Um, you know, you can refer to this at your leisure after I post it, um, but this is kind of what I used as my, my guidance. Um, I also included the, the relevant pages from the equipment register in here. Um, this is the, the reprint from the NMRA, and I included it here because a, a lot of people have it, so it's easy to refer to. Um, this, I broke that full page up into two there, and then this is what went on to the, the next page. Um, so one thing I, I wanna mention, even though I'm covering prototypes here, I don't spend a lot of time talking about painting and lettering. Um, you know, that's a subject unto itself. There is a, a book that covers that, 
Um, I think that that book is phenomenal in, in the detail that it presents. Dick Harley primarily, but you know Tony Thompson as well have really done some great work there. I've been communicating with Dick about kind of one major, um, I guess, change or, or you know, thing that will come out that will sort of throw a bit of what we've thought about P, PFE painting and lettering in the late 40s and early 50s into a, a bit of upheaval, but um, you know, we'll cover that at a separate time. So uh, the first thing I'm gonna cover are the wood cars. Um, and again, the context is in the early 50s. So um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the cars as they were built and focus more on what they looked like in the early 50s. Uh, so um, the fleet, you know, PFE had a massive fleet and beginning when PFE was incorporated in 1906, they, I mean, their service was hauling produce. So rolling stock was, was the main focus of that. Uh, they made a lot of acquisitions at the beginning of the, uh, the century from around 1906 to the early teens. And then they continued with a big buying spree in the teens and the twenties. Um, and then they added a few classes uh, toward the end of the twenties. There was a bit of a slowdown um, in the, the early thirties. And then things picked, picked back up again after that. Um, they had rebuilding programs for, for a while. You know, most people are familiar with the kind of the late 30s into the mid to late 40s, that big rebuilding program, but there were others before that. Um, I highly recommend you, again, refer to the book and Dick Harley's website, which is also linked in the references here. Um, so uh, one thing I do wanna point out, there are a couple different types of underframes that sort of dominate PFE's uh, wood car construction. And I, I put them all here. Um, the one that you see at the right here that I'm calling the early Bettendorf uh, was you know, significant fra from basically the, the early period all the way up until the, the 20s and into the mid 20s. You notice it has uh, the kind of defining feature or the most relevant feature, and I'm hoping you can see my cursor on the screen here because I'm circling it, is that cast um, piece that was uh, at the end of the bolsters there. And you'll see it a lot. Um, it you know is I-beam in cross section, but it has these uh, webs behind it. And those webs have like a, a circular shape to them. And then the built up under frames, there were kind of two flavors. Uh, one is, as I'm circling here, what I call unflanged. Um, and then the bottom one is flanged. And those flanges are very easy to see. Uh, you know, you can see the flat face of the flange at the end of it there. Um, that's what you see in the, uh, the Tishy reefer kit. Um, it's very noticeable. And then the unfl unflanged, there are basically no flanges there. So, you know, it's just a straight shot straight through. There's, there's no face to see there. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then one that really didn't get a lot of, um, I'll call it press at all, including in the, um, the PFE book, is this end um, casting on the body bolster of the, the Dash 14s. And granted, the Dash 14 was not a huge class, but it had a distinct casting at the end. And you notice it has those two square openings in the face of it. Um, it doesn't have that sort of circular shape at the edges. Um, you know, those were used for towing loops. And then while we're on the subject here and you can see this photo, um, you can see the, the T-section truck that was used on a lot of the, uh, the PFE reefers in the um, teens and 20s. So uh, I'm gonna jump into the R30-4 and R40-4. Um, PFE built a bunch of new cars to the R40-4 standard. And then they also used uh, existing underframes to build cars to R30 and R40-4 rebuilds. Um, this was sig a significant group of cars because it was the first time that PFA used steel for the superstructure of the cars, which is the, the underlying structure of the cars. Um, they also improved insulation and they, they used power handbrakes, which were relatively new to PFE at that time as well. Um, they had introduced them with the R40-2 and then you know, all of these uh, R-4 classes used that as well. Um, so they built 
a group of new R40-4s uh, in that 38563 series. And then they rebuilt 510 R40-4s um, in these series that I listed here. Um, those were basically, they completely, uh, the, the joke with PFE was they would jack up the car number and then put a new car under it. Um, everything was pretty much new, including the underframes. Um, and then they also used some uh, R30-11s, uh, which were already, you know, some of them were um, 12, 13 years old, and they used those underframes and put um, dash four bodies on top of them with seal superstructures. You have 619 cars there. Uh, so here's some photos of those. Um, this is an R40-4, which was, um, these were drawn from the R30-2 to R30-6 classes, and they put entirely new car bodies on new underframes as well. I mean, these were basically brand new cars. Um, they salvaged hardware and, and a few other things. Um, uh, the head ladders, power handbrakes, as you see here, um, but this was almost an entirely new car. Uh, here's a shot of another one. Um, one interesting thing, even though they called it reconditioned, um, you can see the stencil. Oh, okay, that was a little awkward. Um, you can see the, the stenciling here, they actually said that the car was built in April of 31. And that was what I was alluding to where almost everything about the car was new, even though um, you know, it, it was classified as a rebuild, it was, it was really built. And then this car was reconditioned in March of 1951. One thing of, of note are these, um, these additions at the body bolsters there. This was something you would see on a lot of PFE cars in the um, beginning in around 1949 and into the 50s, where they would strengthen, strengthen that area uh, at the body bolsters. This car also, you notice, has no, even though it still has wood covered hatch platforms, uh, I mean, uh, uh, hatch covers, the platforms have been removed at this point. Um, and then here's one of the R30s uh, dash fours. Uh, again, this was a situation where they did have an existing on your frame from a uh, R30-11, and they put a dash four body on top of it. So this, this was more um, a car that you know, had an existing underframe with a new body, put it on top of it, as opposed to uh, you know, essentially a whole new car. Um, the R30-8 and R40-8s were also uh, essentially similar to those dash fours that we were showing. Um, the R40 dash eights were almost entirely new cars, even though they called them um, rebuilds. And then the R30 dash 11s, similarly to the dash four I just showed you, uh, took that R30 dash 11 underframe and put a um, modern car body on top of it with steel superstructure. Um, Eventually, these were all merged into one series, so it's, it's kind of hard to track individual cars without photographs or, or you know, it's, uh, accessing the car cards that are available at the California State Railroad Museum Library. Um, so this is one of the R40-8s, and again, I say built, even though it's a rebuild, um, that was um, rebuilt in 1932. Uh, this car had simplex trucks, which you see here, which are, you know, extremely unusual design uh, that really stand out. One other thing to point out, um, they had these sheet metal enameled medallions, both on both sides of the car. And those are, you know, really interesting. I would love to get my hands on one today. Um, they were phased out in early 37, they had problems with them staying on the car sides because they were screwed on and they would come loose. Obviously that's a, uh, a major um, hazard if one of those falls off. Uh, you can see also at the time these cars were rebuilt, they had um, wood uh, hatch platforms to go around the hatch covers. 
Here's another one of those cars. I, you know, this is exactly the same, but the reason I included it here is it has a very early version of the national type B truck. Um, again, power handbrakes, uh, almost an entirely new car. You know, the only thing that was salvaged could be things like, um, you know, hinges, latching mechanisms, grab irons, things like that. And then here's one of those R30s uh, dash 11s that was, uh, had a new car body placed on top of it. Uh, it had an R30-11 underframe, as you can see here, but the, the car body's entirely new. Um, you know, it, it's interesting to note that um, some of those dash fours and dash eights, uh, after they were rebuilt, you know, they were essentially uh, new cars. They lasted, you know, some of them well into the 50s. So these weren't things that were rebuilt and had a short service life. They, they continued for another 20 plus years. Um, so the, the depression kind of slowed down rebuilding for a while, but then in 1938, PFE um, embarked on the program to, you know, shop um, a lot of the R30, 12, 13, and 14 cars that had been in service for, you know, 15, uh, some of them coming up on 20 years, and they're starting to um, need major shopping. So they began bringing them in, and they started with the Dash 9. Uh, eventually, they would uh, rebuild 20,000 cars. Um, the Dash 9s were technically reconditioned, meaning that they did not rebuild them with steel superstructure. They replaced the wood superstructure pieces. Um, so those cars you know, were expected to only last for 10 years before they, they would need more uh, serious re reconditioning, reshopping, which they would do in the late 40s. But um, they did add things like ladders, um, they started modernizing things like uh, removing the wood hatch platforms. Um, some of the later cars received Equipco integral hatch covers. Um, they did retain their, their KC brakes though. Um, very few of them received um, things like circulating fans uh, and over 7,900 of these cars were refurbished as Dash 9s making them the um, you know, by far the largest of the rebuilt groups. So here's a, a photo of one of them. Um, this car was originally an R30-12 and stenciling standards at the time that these were um, refurbished or reconditioned, and you can see the stencil here, completely reconditioned. It shows you when it was built and when it was reconditioned. The standards at the time were that you had the original class, so R30-12, and then added a dash nine at the end of it. That was simplified later um, to just R30-9, and I'll give you the, the date of that as we go along. Um, this car had the, the T-section trucks. Uh, at the time, it was reconditioned. It, the, the Overland um, UP medallion was still being used. Uh, so, you know, this, this is kind of the way most of these look. This one in particular is interesting because it had Equipco integral hatch covers, which you know, uh, some of the last ones did, still has its KC brakes. Um, here's a, a photo of one of these cars after it had been repainted in October of 46 at Roseville. Um, this one was rebuilt in 1937. Uh, so it, you know, at the time it was repainted here, it was still a few years shy of needing another rebuilding. Um, it still had uh, platforms around the hatch covers, um, being that it was 92, 788, it was still relatively early in the, the Dash 9 rebuilding program. Uh, here's one that was uh, reconditioned in 1949, November 49. Uh, at that time, it would have received steel superstructure. This particular one had plywood sheathing added to it. Um, it also had these uh, plates um, at the body bolsters that you know uh, added a little bit of strength there. Um, it had wood covered uh, hatch covers, but the platforms had been removed as you see here. Um, and this was a car that I covered uh, in the clinic on the plywood sheet cars. And here's a shot of one of these in the um, 
the 50s. This was uh, rebuilt in Tucson in 1950. At that time, it would have had steel superstructure added. Um, it has a built up underframe, as you see here with the flanges. Um, and this particular one also has a quick co hatch covers. Uh, last of the dash mines that I'll show here, this one, um, you know, is showing it in the late 50s. Um, the paint scheme is pretty simplified. There's no lines above and below the reporting marks. There's no periods. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It, it does have these uh, strengtheners at the body bolsters. Um, and then here's a shot just from above showing you what those uh, platforms around the hatch covers look like. Uh, moving on to the 16, you know, as, as this program progressed, they would um, upgrade as as other you know, specialties became available. The 16s started using a uh, Murphy roof with rectangular corrugated panels. Um, it also used Equipco integral hatch covers. And these were the second largest group of rebuilds. There were over 3,500 with the last, uh, you know, roughly two thirds of them uh, were fitted with AB schedule brakes. There were also some, some details in these. Um, 500 cars got Preco fans. Uh, there were a small number that had plywood sheeting and lining, and they did an experiment with five um, cars having dreadnought ends. Um, so here's what a couple of these cars looked like. Um, these were very uh, recent uh, rebuilds. Um, this is probably when these cars were no more than you know a couple of years old. This shot is during World War II, and you can see they have the um, rectangular panel roofs on them. Uh, Equipco hatch covers, you notice these are uh, staged, whereas uh, these are closed here. Both of these are dash 16s. The car over here is uh, a dash four um, or dash eight. Uh, you know, it has the ladders, it has the um, enamel sheet metal medallions. Um, I can't really tell beyond that without getting a car number, which it is. Uh, but it also has the um, outside metal sheath roof that was common on a lot of the earlier cars. This is a shot of one of the Dash 16s um, that was, it was actually repainted fairly quickly after its rebuilding. Um, this is the scheme that was introduced in 1942. Uh, you know, this car would have been um, painted within a, just a few years after its rebuilding. Uh, and you can see also the, the corrugations of the rectangular panel roof there. Um, here's another shot of one of these. Again, the, some of these still had their, their KC brakes, which this car did. This is a, a repaint um, in the 1946 scheme. This particular car was repainted in 47. They still had the, the wood ends, even though they, they had the uh, rectangular panel roof. Um, the 18s uh, continued the evolution. They introduced dreadnought ends convertible bulkheads and AB brakes. This was also a large class of 2,500 cars. There's a shot of one of them. Um, this is a, was, had a 40 ton underframe um, built up. You can see the, the W uh, section round corner dreadnought ends, which was a big difference. One thing I want, I want to point out with this shot, um, this Union Pacific medallion, the red and white stripes were actually reversed from what the, the standards called for. That's something that actually is, is quite common. Um, so it's, you know, it, you would think it's, it's exceptional, but it's, it's a lettering scheme that, um, you know, if you have a large enough fleet of these cars, uh, it's something you should integrate into your, um, your fleet because it, it shows up. I'll show you here fairly regularly. Um, here's another R40-18. Uh, this car has the 1950 painting and lettering scheme. Um, I call it hybrid because the stage icing stenciling is up here, but by the time this scheme was introduced, that actually should have been down here. So, uh, you know, it's a slight little variation. Notice the ARA type Y trucks on, on this particular car. Moving on to the 19, um, the, the 19s were almost identical to the 18s. The, the big shift was that these had steel running boards. Um, there were a thousand of these. They were done right at the end of the war. Um, I only have actually in my collection one photo of these. Um, this particular one, uh, you know, had these extra plates added to the body bolsters. 
Uh, and it, by this time, it had also had a um, preco circulating fan added to it as well. But you know that those were later add-ons. Um, these were very similar to the Dash 18s. And then the the 21s um, were again, from a body perspective, were very very similar. Um, the the big thing with them was they had uh, circulating fans added to them, mechanical ones. Um, mechanical meaning that they were driven by uh, belts that actually attached to an axle on the trucks. Um, you know, there were, there were some issues with those, but um, that was how they, they started with the first uh, circulating fans was, was that mechanical fashion. Um, if you look in the official railway equipment registers of the like late 40s and early 50s, they will tell you which model fans they had in them. Um, by the time of the January 53 register, that's not listed in there. So I, I don't know when they ceased doing that. Again, this was a large class, almost 2,500 cars rebuilt between 45 and 47. Um, here's a, a really good photo of one. Um, you know, you can see the, the plate here for the fan uh, shaft. Um, again, I'll note, this is another one of those cars where the red and white were reversed in the medallion. Uh, here is another shot. This is one of the early uh, Dash 21s before the 1946 paint scheme. So this has an SP medallion on this side. It would have had a UP medallion on the other side. Uh, you get a good view of the round corner dreadnought ends. This is a 30 ton Bettendorf under frame. You can see by the bolsters there. This particular car had Preco G17 fans. And then here's a, a color photo of one of these later in life. Again, it has some of the additional like strengthening uh, added at the body bolsters there. And then the 24s, these were the last group of the, uh, the you know, big rebuilds. Um, by this time, uh, they had shifted to improved dreadnought ends. They were using brand new trucks instead of replacements. Uh, the last 200 cars had diagonal panel Murphy roofs, and these had full height door openings. Um, they used plywood sheathing when they were uh, resheathed, so they have a distinctive look as well. Um, and they were uh, improved with uh, added two different types of mechanical circulating fans. So here you can see that improved dreadnought end. It's quite visible there. Um, the plywood sheathing, which you know looks rather uh, plain to the eye. Um, you can see the air circulating fan shaft and plate here. Um, this is a view from the side. This shows you the, the joints between the plywood sheathing there. This particular truck uh, car had brand new ASF A3 ride control trucks. You can also see the door opening goes right to the top of the side there. And here's a photo of one of these later. Uh, many of them had the plywood sheathing replaced with tongue and groove uh, sheathing. Uh, it, the plywood was not particularly um, long lived. Um, and then I, I'll briefly mention the Western Pacific cars here. They had contributed 2,775 cars to the PFE fleet in 1923-24. Um, they were reconditioned with uh, new wood superstructures at you know, the same time that the, the Dash 9 and some of the Dash 16 classes were created of rebuilds. Um, by the late 40s, these cars were not in great shape. They were needing uh, major repairs again. Um, Western Pacific was not interested in spending a lot of money to, to do that. So they agreed to rebuild 900 cars to the current standards. Um, they could only find 899 to do. So um, they rebuilt them with steel, steel superstructures. They received Preco AA15 electric fans, um, which was also the same fan that was going into the R40-26 cars that were being built new. But um, Western Pacific rejected new roofs and new ends. So they, you know, they ended up with the same outside metal roofs and, and wood ends of the original cars. Uh, as you can see here, um, they also used the same wood sheathed hatch cover still, and they eliminated the platforms. Um, these you know, did not last very long um, after this, and uh, Western Pacific by the late 50s was making different arrangements to supply cars. Uh, I just included this detail shot. Uh, it shows you what the platform looks like. Uh, you can see how the, 
the hatch plug and the hatch cover were actually two distinct pieces. Um, and you can see the uh, metal piece that was used to prop, prop open the, uh, the hatch covers when that was necessary. Um, jumping into the steel cars, uh, the, the first major um, purchases for new, st new steel cars by PFE were the R4010 class. Uh, they built slash acquired 4,700 cars in 36 and 37. They very closely followed the ARA32 boxcar design with um, tab side sill supports, the square corner dreadnought ends, the Murphy rectangular panel roof, and the, the AAR design um, underframe. Um, it's worth noting that the sides used um, alternate center rivets, which is not something that was uh, typical on the, the ARA boxcar. Um, that's just because they used a, a U-section flanged um, structural members behind the steel. Um, they also increased insulation. Uh, one note is the insulation dry zero K-POC is what it was called, and the sides and the roof was extremely um, flammable. So if you had um, situations where um, drains and things like that got plugged with ice uh, and they had to use flames to, to uh, torches to melt that ice so clear out the drains, um, they had instances where um, the insulation would catch on fire, uh, which was not a good thing, and they would they had to add special stenciling to the car sides to avoid which, and that stenciling um, was placed right here. This particular car is, is almost brand new, so it doesn't have it, but it was between the end of the car here and the trust plate or trust stenciling that you know advised the crews not to use flames or torches. Um, this is a photo of one of the cars right after being built. You notice that sharp corner dreadnought end there. Um, the, the hatch covers were um, uh, metal, and then you had the normal plugs, but they were not integral. Uh, here's a shot of one of those uh, after you know, a couple of years in service. I put this one in to highlight the um, barber trucks. They had a lot of different trucks, a lot of different power handbrakes. Um, so it was kind of a, a, a mix of, of things. If you add uh, you know, a few of these to your fleet, you can mix and match some of the, the trucks and, and handbrakes to give a little variety. Um, here's one in um, the late 40s that had been repainted when in the 42 scheme, you can see that UP medallion there. Uh, here's a shot of one. Uh, this is the 46 paint scheme. Uh, notice these early national type B trucks. The openings are not round. They have a, an unusual shape. And I included this shot here. This is from the URAC collection. This gives you a really good look at the, uh, the underframe. Um, you know, you can see how the reservoirs hung there. And one thing that's an interesting detail is this wood piece added to the face of the center sills. And that says defect cards on there. That's where they would uh, tack the notations. If, you know, the, the card needed maintenance, they would add that there. Uh, the R40-14 was a, a follow-on. Very, very similar to the 10. Uh, the, the big changes were the uh, round corner dreadnought ends and Quipco integral hatch covers. Um, less visible would be convertible ice bunkers uh, and plywood lining. Uh, convertible ice bunkers were just bunkers that could be kind of folded up and stowed uh, to use the complete cubic capacity of the car if it was hauling things that didn't require icing. Uh, so, you know, insulated service or maybe a backhaul um, where they could load it with, uh, you know, with various types of, weight, uh, of loads that could be put into these cars. And then uh, placard boards. The, the R40-10s did not have placard boards. You can see the placard board here and the root card board here at the um, bolster tab there. Um, this particular car had been repainted in, in 1945, just uh, after only about four years of service. And here's another one um, uh, that had not been repainted. I, you know, I, I love refrigerator cars where you can see this, where you have this fresh patch of paint where the uh, reway stenciling was updated on an otherwise, <clears throat> excuse me, dirty car. Uh, the R40-20 was a class of 1,002 cars. 
Um, the two cars I noticed with this, uh, noted with this asterisk here, they were built as an experiment by Consolidated Steel. Again, they were very close to the, the class before them. Um, the biggest difference was they had uh, larger root card boards that were mounted to the left of the doors. I'll show you that. Um, they were also one and a half inches taller, which is you know, barely perceptible. Um, and they had herringbone floor racks inside the cars, which with the slats oriented at a diagonal, diagonal which you know, made handling inside the car a little bit easier. Um, they were fitted with Preco fans beginning in 1950. Uh, here's one of the cars in late September 51. You can see it's had the fans added. You can see the, the shaft here. Um, they're quite dirty. Uh, here's a shot of another one in December of 51. This one's been repainted. Uh, again, it's also been equipped with uh, fans as well. Oh, uh, I should have noted that the, the root card board I mentioned here um, has been added here. They had these placard boards on both uh, there to the left of the door. And then the R40-23 was the largest class of uh, ice-cooled steel cars. There were 5,000 of them built in 47. They were broken up into two series. Uh, these were the first ones built new with fans. Um, they were equipped with uh, welded underframes, which was also something new for PFE, and they had improved dreadnought ends. Um, they used ASF A3 ride control trucks, which uh, PFE really liked the, the qualities of, of not just these ride control trucks, but others that you know, were improved riding trucks introduced in the 40s. Um, one interesting thing, they were built with high strength steel, which was a little bit thinner. So it, it offered some benefits in weight, but it was not good at corrosion resistance. So they returned to the same steel they'd been using before for the Dash 25 cars. Um, also, they used what's called blind offset plywood walls that uh, had a space between the, the, um, the, the interior and exterior. So it improved circulation and it mitigated outside heat transmission. And this became standard on the uh, subsequent um, ice cooled cars. So here's a shot of one of these. Um, very soon after building, uh, you can see, uh, you know, they're very attractive cars. There's a lot of black and um, obviously the orange sides. They had, uh, in 1946, these are the first new cars with the scheme where both medallions were on uh, each side of the car. The UP medallion is red, white, and blue, very attractive. Um, and these had welded underframes. You can see the absence of rivets along the side sills there. Uh, here's a shot that shows you at an angle. You can see the... Um, Improved dreadnought end. The shadow there, you can also see that uh, grid work of an expanded metal um, running board. Uh, the R25, very, very similar to the uh, 23s. Um, there were you know, a few upgrades, um, and they also had um, mechanical fans like the 23s, different variety of Preco, though. And they had stationary. Um, ice bunkers, uh, which was uh, a change. Um, one thing to note, these cars um, did not have black hardware. So it was everything on the sides was the same as the, the color as the car side. The sill steps at the ends were also the same color. Um, all the tabs below the side sills and the center steps were still black. Um, and uh, you know, these also had diagonal uh, panel um, roofs, which was uh, a change from the Dash 23s. And you can't see it in these photos, unfortunately, but um, there's a very narrow corrugation across the top of the end that's a change from the um, R40-23. And then as you can see here, the uh, sides, again, everything uh, with repaints in the 50s, everything was yellow, including the, the side sill support tabs. And then the Dash 26, that's the, the last new car we're gonna cover in here. Um, these were a lot different in that they had uh, Youngstown plug doors with six foot door openings, which were starting to be requested by shippers to allow um, forklifts and, and such into the cars. 
Um, they were also the first cars built new with overhead electric fans, which provided better circulation, and they had uh, floor racks with metal slats. Um, and lastly, insulation was entirely fiberglass. These were the first cars with that. Um, they were also delivered with the new painting and lettering scheme introduced in 1950. So you had a different UP uh, medallion. And what was interesting was the um, Southern Pacific uh, medallion was always closest to the B end. So if you looked at the other side of the car, the UP medallion would be in this place and the SP would be here. Uh, the periods were also dropped from the reporting marks by this time. And then uh, when these cars were repainted, um, the lines were dropped from the reporting marks as well. Uh, and obviously you can see the, the plug door, which is a uh, big change. Um, gonna touch quickly on a couple other classes of cars. Um, in the post-war period, the PFE rebuilt some R50-1s into uh, super insulated frozen food cars. Um, there were two groups of them rebuilt. Uh, the first was 45, um, and those were in the 301 to 375 series. Those had tongue and groove sheathing and the, the 1945 standard lettering. Um, and then like the car seen here, 379 to 587, these had plywood sheathing and the 1946 uh, lettering. Um, again, I'm going to highlight, this is another one where the red and white reversed in the UP medallion. Um, here's a shot of one of these cars. This was originally had plywood uh, sheathing. This one has been resheathed with tongue and groove. Uh, you can get a sense of you know, how massive these underframes were. Um, and this also had you know, additional stiffeners added at the body bolsters there. And then uh, the BR1, uh, when these cars were built, they were not classed BR1. That was actually something that was added later. But um, these were 300 cars built in 23 and 24 for express service and pas passenger consists. Um, when REA was created, they ended up um, in REA assignment, even though PFE um, you know, handled a lot of the actual uh, icing and, and such for them. Um, in 52, 55 cars received heavy repairs. Um, there was a, uh, a shortage of um, refrigerated express cars in this time period. So PFE went back and rebuilt 83 of the cars at Nampa, Idaho. They added steel superstructures, they increased the insulation, they added electric fans and uh, steel channel side sills. Um, also to help with the, um, the shortage of express refrigerator cars, they took um, 50 um, R40-10s and modified them for express service like you see here. Um, they added Stephen signal lines, uh, steel running boards, um, electric fans, and also express trucks, either Chrysler or Symington Gould. Uh, the one you see here is a, a Chrysler truck. Um, these cars served in, in this uh, for a while, and then they were converted back to uh, freight service, I believe, in the, the late 50s. Uh, it's in the PFE book. Um, you'll see the, the way this car is painted here, it was actually green with uh, deluxe gold lettering. And I have a couple of pictures in here just to show you a few things. This is an R4010, um, you know, icing these, these cars with a heavily manual uh, operation. They had to break the ice up into various sizes depending upon what the shipper was requesting. Uh, so you can see here, this, this person is um, putting the ice into the bunker as you see here. Um, and then this is a shot of uh, some lemons that are already boxed being loaded into an R40-23. Um, again, loading these cars was a, you know, in some ways was heavily manual. This, this was not being done with a forklift. Um, here are the references I mentioned. Um, all of these are live links. So you can uh, follow these to uh, when I uh, have this presentation posted. Um, you'll be able to follow these links to get to the various uh, sources of information. Um, and here again are the thank yous. There is the link to the address where this will be posted. 
Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any now.